you, everybody. Do you hear me? Good. Um, I flew in this morning, and I'm uh, really interested about the first half of the conference and how it went, so let's talk about that later. Um, this is what's on my mind. In the three and a half years, um, I was in a strategic design partnership with Magic Leap while working at Argo Design, where I'm a founding partner. Um, we were often just thinking about what we could do with the technology. And we didn't often slow down and go, why and where is it all headed? And so I put some of those thoughts down for us to discuss in the resonant space today. And if you need to leave in the middle, that's fine. Just bring me back a Red Bull, okay? Because I haven't slept. <laughs> I speak a lot about the digital lifestyle. We all lead one. And I often used to talk about it this way, about it being a choice. We would choose our digital lifestyle over our own real world safety. And this is like for a product designer, like an ultimate value statement. And then it became real. The choice was taken away. And all of our socialization, productivity, and um, uh, entertainment started coming through these same uh, digital lifestyles. So, and at that point, we all became squares. It's, we'll just have to acknowledge it. And art became squares itself. And some of us tried doing art in squares. This is me doing four hours of silence, or one full hour of silence for the House of Beautiful Business, another conference that happens in Europe, uh, on Zoom, which is kind of weird, because you don't know if anyone's actually being silent or if they just muted their microphone, but I sure felt like I had to be. Uh, I think it's important to note that for two years, we all kind of had our own experiences. Some people made a very tight bubble and their work and their life and their digital lifestyle all became the same thing. And some of us went out and explored the world. Um, and some people dealt with the consequences of what was happening during that time. I think it's just important to recognize that we all had very different experiences. And now that we're all coming back together, we're recognizing that there was asymmetry. And this asymmetry, I think, is a really important point right now when it talks, when we think about the world of technology, right? There's my data. It's very similar, but very much different from me. And then there's reality, and then there is the virtual reality, and there is what is available, um, you know, what we worked so hard on for three and a half years, and then there is what people would actually wear out into the world. And then there is even the divorce of ownership itself and objects. So there's a lot of asymmetry in our world right now, and it's really interesting to think about that as we progress through technology. You know, when we created the internet, we were all really excited. I'm a Gen Xer, and we were really excited. Information for everyone, free and available for everyone. And then the second wave came along, we were like, holy cow, you could sell things on this. You could charge some people for access. And then the early days of Web3 came along and it seemed, it seemed to be like, holy crap, we could charge for everything. <laughs> and anytime something like that comes up, I'm like, let's do something immersive. And in my world, immersive is let's throw a party. Yeah, we put on headsets all the time, but this time we decided to do a party.me. And it was partly to uh, celebrate the opening of our new studio in Austin. And we just opened a studio in Munich. We have one in Amsterdam down the street here, or the rails. And uh, we have one in New York. Um, but we thought we'd examine some of the problems that were happening out there in terms of uh, the currency side of Web3. And one of the problems was that you have to get out your phone and unlock it and have some sort of digital wallet. And we're like, what if you could create some sort of token that represented the token that you had digitally, like something real that you could put in your pocket? So we made them. We called them K-Coins. And we needed a way to earn K-Coins. We looked at proof of work and it, well, it seemed like a lot of work or a lot of power. And so we instead we decided to do proof of talent. And so in order to earn K coins, what you had to do was sing karaoke. The K in K coin is karaoke. And when you sang karaoke, you got K coins. And then you needed something to spend them on. So we had like swag you could buy. You Maybe you could sing a bunch or sing really well and buy a coffee pot. Or maybe you're more into experiences. So you head to the bar and buy a cocktail or maybe you're into altruism, and therefore you uh, could drop them in this thing. And for everyone that got dropped in here, we would donate a dollar to Black Girls Code because diversity and technology and design is close to our hearts. 
Uh, so we had this all throughout the party, and of course it was a very volatile market because it was all kept getting flooded with K-Coin, and it kept K-Coin kept going up and down in price. And there were moments in the party where you go to the bar to buy a cocktail, and K-Coin had inverted, meaning that they handed you a cocktail and a pile of K-Coin at the same time because it was a negative value. Um, and then one thing we really thought we needed to do is that people want to be able to you know, have a sense of ownership or speculative. So we created something that we called um, K-ownership. And uh, we, we made what we would call CFTs in order to record K-ownership. These are called completely fungible tokens. And then we wanted to record that ownership and we decided we would do that on something we called um, a block board. And uh, we have about 20 whiteboards in our office and if you uh, used K-Coin, to establish K ownership of an item like our Cobra. We have a 1965 Shelby Cobra in the office that we all built together over two years. Um, you pay 50K coin and then you have K ownership of it. Um, and we would record that on the block board and then that would get transferred to every block board in the office. And so as long as you were quicker than people erasing it, then you always had ownership of it. Um, and then the price would double. You could try, now you're probably wondering what two things. What is K ownership? Well, it is your name on the ledger of the block board. You don't actually have ownership of the Cobra. You don't have access to the Cobra. We would prefer you did not touch the Cobra. All you have is K-ownership. The second thing you're probably wondering, is it pronounced K-ownership or is it pronounced Connorship? Well, no. Well, in the end, our block boards got hacked and the whole thing turned into a disaster. But well, we had a good time getting together again, and it's a good time getting together here together. So let's go back to this statement. It's all money charged for everything. I decided to make a wish lip for, for W3. Here's what W3 maybe could actually produce for humanity instead of currently what it's producing, which is some weird ledger for art and a whole lot of uh, financial disasters. First thing I would wish for is a data marketplace, okay? Uh, right now, our data is something that is out there, and we have a sense that it has value, but we have no ownership or control over it. But imagine we could establish a data marketplace. Well, we would need an interface for it. And so we designed an interface for it. It's this little ring, and it would be backed up with an app. And, then we re and with this little ring, you could turn on and off your accessibility for data, so you could go quiet and private, or you could turn it on and start sharing your data, or you could acknowledge little contracts uh, if, to make a data marketplace. And one thing we recognized when we were thinking about this is there's no language around data and we need to build a language around data. There's language around money. If I spot you a 20, I loan you a 20, I Venmo you a 20, I take out a mortgage for $20. All those little words have meanings that represent huge concepts and actual whole processes of how money is shared. We need, need the same thing around data so we can actually begin transacting in it. So community data would be anonymized data about um, certain demographic issues that could be used for the community for things like understanding how many people use this park and what their age demographics are. Medical data would be very private, held from the government, even held from your own family members, but it would have identity associated with it. So you could use it to perhaps you know, be like, oh, I'm vaccinated so I could get on this train. And then you could imagine there's a lot of different kinds of data that you would own and with a little bit of terminology you could begin using it for things. So an example is I would be, uh, I left my coat when I was shopping in the square, right? Uh, I was shopping for tulips or something like that. And, um, and so I uh, pull up an app and I say, you can use my likeness data in order to find my jacket. And that established is a contract. And now that company takes my likeness data and they use, go into the data marketplace and they pull all the feeds of the public ca um, cameras out there and they find me in them and they track me back down to where they see me in my jacket. And then they report back to me, you left your jacket over here at this marketplace or in this theater, right? And then, here's the crazy part, they erase the data. Because that's part of the contract, right? I gave them use of my likeness data to find my jacket and nothing more. And that's not the way it works today. Today, you, you play some funny game where you make an AI avatar for yourself in five glorious pictures. And meanwhile, they're memorized all your features and on the back end are selling them to someone else to do various things for you. And that's not the way it should work. Right? And in this world, we can start experimenting with other things like hyper-democracy, right? Because my data is following me around. When I got on the subway, there could be a little turnstile that said, hey, do we want to change number four to an express line? And if you said yes, you'd walk through it. 
And if you said no, you'd back through it or something like that, right? And so now we can start getting more granular with our moments of data, not just uh, treat it as just features. The second thing I would ask for is a new computing metaphor. This is very relevant to this room because we're all talking about immersive experiences and a lot of virtual reality, but mixed reality too. This relates to that adoptable and available thing, right? And also because I'm not sure Dollyverse is going to be what um, uh, it all ends up being. And there is a Dollyverse. Uh, it debuted at South by Southwest um, just before our big party, right? Um, I think it's going to be a lot bigger than that. So let's talk a little bit about that. How, are, how is this going to change the way we live our digital lifestyles? Well, right now, computing is immersive, okay? Really, when you think about it, Computing handles all the abstract workflows of socialization, of entertainment, information, and planning, right? This is design, this is strategy, operations, accounting. And no wonder, these devices are amazing in that they have no respect to the laws of physics. They're totally asymmetrical. I can take an entire skyscraper and I can audit it and look at every bolt in, the, in a little screen like this. And they're also very immersive technologies, right? And right now, 50% of our waking life and 50% of our workforce is computerized through immersive technologies, right? And virtual reality, even though it it's probably the biggest screen size you can have, and in a lot of ways it feels very spatial, it's another immersive technology, and likely it's gonna cannibalize off of these other immersive technologies because it deals very well with abstract things that don't have to have a one-to-one -one relationship to the world, right? But that's not the only thing that we do in our lives, okay? We also spend a lot of time in places where we need to be present. And there's a very interesting thing that happens when you put the computer on somebody, whether it's pass-through VR, whether it's mixed reality like the Magic Leap headset, or our Reality X classes that we designed here as a provocation of what people actually would wear um, in terms of consumers, not enterprise, right? But when you take a, a device and put it on you and you give it the same outlook of the world, it turns everything around and now you're more present, it begins doing a lot more object recommendation and stuff. Now, so now, this could enable computing to enter that other half of life, right? You're a mechanic who's fixing the plane. You're like planning, space planning in a building, right? It's called programming when you take an empty space and decide what furniture will fit in it, right? And in this place, you can be heads up, you can be present, you can mark up the physical spaces with digital information, and you can be in cooperative interfaces because everything is lined up looking in the same direction. And I'm, I'm going to argue uh, in this room with all of us that this is where the big growth is going to be over the next 10, 15 years. And the reason is not because the technology or the fidelity, it's because that's the green field. We're already doing all the immersive computing you want. If you're going to do it in, with a, a wearable computer versus a laptop, it's a, it's a debate of interface. But what you're doing there is already done digital. On this other side, the present side, computing is a hindrance. The devices we have for doing it today are very limited. And so we're doing very little present computing. Often we're like, go immersing, present, immersing, present, immersing, present. Or we're building giant screens to, to try and help us out. Or we're using projection. Or we're using voice computing. But there's huge, if we're going to get to 100% of our life computing, this is the area where there's going to be an explosion in use, in, in my opinion. And one of the reasons why is, is placefulness. It's a bit of a, a long argument, but let me lay it out for you. Mark Ralston is, a, one, of, is the, one of the other founders at Argo Design and coined that term, right? This is today's experience. Let's say you're a housekeeper at a hotel. You have an app. That app just serves up web pages. You open your phone. You unlock it. You go into it. You find the app. You log into the app. You go to the section for housekeeping. You go to the section for your task for the day, which is cleaning the rooms. You put in a room number, and you get a response back that's something like this. Room 4532 needs service. It'll be ready for that around 10 or 11. And then you back back out, and you go back in your room 530. When you back back out, you back back in your room 530, okay? A lot of what we do as UI UX designers is establish context for the user, but placefulness, taking that exact same UI and just locating it next to the door in the hall takes all of those clicks away. It even takes the way, away the need even to possibly put the room number there. Suddenly I can absorb a lot more information with fewer clicks. That's what we call reduction of friction. Anytime we reduce friction in computing, we see greater adoption. 
Okay, that's why this area, that's one of the ways we're going to do this stuff. Here's an example. Every uh, microbrewery has a room called the engineering room, and it has four monitors on it. They've all been Internet of Thinged up. So all the switches and the sensors are digital. They report to the cloud, and then they show you, they show to you on a web page. And that web page is up in a room on a monitor, and there's a guy who sits up there or a woman who sits up there with a radio. And someone on the floor says, I need you to turn off this switch. And they're up there, right? Just move all that interface to your face, and now you have a much lower frictioned experience. Now you can benefit from the killer app of all computing, which is multitasking. I can put up something from SAP that says what my shift is next week. I can show work tickets up there as well as showing the information from the IoT sensors as well. But we wouldn't want someone taking a brewery tour to see this, so we're going to start organizing things in layers. And layers will be just like Google folders. They have this visibility to them, they have permissions to them, and then they have certain um, credentials to them, like you can edit them or not, right? And so now I can just switch between layers which help organize my running software, and the distinction between software and file and folder is changed to a new metaphor that works in the places that we are at. And now you could say the presentation is on my desk, when you say that, it means a couple of things. One, the presentation could literally be on your desk, and it could benefit from all the beauties of being 3D, you know, and it's going to be a very different presentation from what we see today. But when I said the presentation is on my desk, not just because this imagery is up there, but you naturally started imagining my desk. You've never been to my office. You don't know where my desk is, but you can't help it because this is what helped us get off the Serengeti plane, is we are geographical creatures. Right? So I could give you an iPhone app, and I could say the presentation's on my desk. You'll go in there, you'll find me, you'll find my desk, and then you'll find the presentation. That's three steps, minus authentication. If you did that with Google, I would have to tell you a lot more. Right? I would have to say, it's in the Argo Design Drive, it's in Jared's folder, it's under uh, daily work, under presentations for this client. It very quickly adds up to seven to nine steps, right? Reduction of friction. We're going to move the friction back just by changing the metaphor of computing from one that is files and folders and desktops, which is something that we inherited from the 1960s office. There are people putting files into folders today who have never owned a filing cabinet and have never actually put a file in a folder. Right? But they all know where their desk is or their room is or their bedroom, right? So we're going to need to change the metaphor. The last one, and I'm almost finished, is a real time internet. Okay? The last thing I would request from these distributed systems that are supposed to change the world and not just make a handful of people very rich um, uh, in some sort of Ponzi scheme. Um, let me set this up for you. Okay, when I go to Amazon.com and you go to Amazon.com and you go to Amazon.com, we all get different pages. They're personalized and they're served up when we request them. The internet was a state machine, but computing is now getting generative, right? You guys recognize this. This is Midsummer or Dolly, any number of new generative art processes. I just said, give me a sparkle bunny on a bike at Burning Man. That's what I got, right? It's not going to end here at art, okay? The latest um, NVIDIA video card renders so many colors at such a high resolution and such speed, it actually exceeds the capability of, capabilities of human perception. The amount of data that can be processed is already past what we can process. The amount that can be memorized is past what we can memorize. Computing is now exceeding human perception. And what that allows us to do is, with, is bring the latency of prediction down to almost nothing, right? And computing is becoming hyper-local at that point as well. A lot of the things we used to do with closed-loop algorithms on the cloud in certain procedural assemblies of atoms and molecules are now actually just being done live on your device without ever a trip back to the server. And what that means is that increasingly we're going to be living in a real-time internet where it's almost like Schrodinger's cat or a quantum internet, if you will. Nothing exists until you look at it and suddenly it's manifested for you. In this model, there is no app store. If I want, I could just say, Apple, help me do the laundry. And in the same way that we are currently generating pictures, it will bring together blocks of codes, known features, 
and assemble an app for you live in the moment to help you do your laundry. This one happens to show you what's going on in the washer and dryer, plays music, and it identifies what clothes belongs to who, so you can fold it all up and put it away. This is what a real-time computing is, and it's, you know, it's only about 10 years away that we're going to be living in that kind of world. Actual sustainability is my fourth wish. Um, have you ever seen this graph before? I didn't see it until last year. This is from the National Science Foundation. The sharp line rising is electricity used for computing. It's the rate at which we are increasing our use of electricity for only computing. The top line is angled up so slightly you can't even see it. That's the amount of electricity that humanity produces. And around 2040, they cross over. So we're going to have to change the way we do things, right? And it's real easy to blame, you know, like I'm in Texas. We have a lot of these, you know, some Bitcoin farm. But that's not what it is. It's the way we do computing. It's how we ship gigabytes of video feeds up to the cloud where we store them, analyze them with all kinds of machine learning algorithms, and then push them back down to the user. And every one of those steps use a lot of power. Look up analog computing. I did it worked recently for a company called Aspinity. Analog computing uses one one hundredth of the power of regular computing. You can put an entire ma uh, machine learning module on a chipset at the edge, and it runs on so little power that it could run for years on a single battery. And what you're going to see happening is that instead of trafficking in data, the, a the era of big data is ending, we're going to traffic in insights. And those insights and events are what are just kilobytes each that are going to be progressed around. So we need to move computing to the edge, and now you know why, or we're going to run out of power. That graph doesn't even accommodate the electrification of, of vehicles, so we really have to really start thinking about this stuff. We tend to stay in our own little silo and use as many cycles as we can, and we don't even think about where the power is coming from. And the last, I'll close with this, is purpose. This can't be the purpose. It can't be all, let's charge money for everything. Everything's ownership. Um, and I would submit that we could all have a common purpose, one that's a little more related to humanity, not technology, and that's to create as much love and intellect as possible. And in order to do that, that means each one of us needs to create as much love and intellect as we can. So as you're making decisions about what you do with your virtual reality startup or what you're going to feature in your content or how you're going to engage players in your game, maybe ask you this question. Is this creating as much love and intellect as it could? And then collectively as humanity, we also need to do the same. Um, you can find me later when we're drinking and ask me about the Solarian myth. We can talk about this. It's really fun. There's really fun little thought experiments that come out of it. I'll close with this sentiment. I have a little philosophy that helps me handle the product designer's dilemma which is, um, should we really design that product and foist it on humanity? Is it doing anything to help humanity? I call it technophilia. Um, and basically, the philosophy states it's okay to love technology so long as you love humanity equally or more. And there's some principles that could help us uh, in terms of where we should apply and how we could apply technology. And they are as, follow as follows. Technology should live in service of humanity, not the other way around. A lot of things we do on Facebook exist to serve Facebook so that we can have more Facebook, Facebooking us all the time, now meta. Um, amplification, not emulation, right? Technology should serve to amplify the abilities in the human condition. It should not serve to emulate it. If it emulates it and becomes successful at it, we're going to end up in competition. Um, it should, we should treat privacy as a virtue. We are creatures who are social because of gossip. It's the difference between us and a lot of the other great apes. This does not mean we do not have a need for privacy, but it may mean we don't have a right for privacy. And what I really mean is privacy as a right is a hard approach because you're creating a citadel, and anyone who can break through that citadel now has ownership of you, and they don't have any responsibility for it. It's what enables the big five to do things like collect all our data and not pay us for it because you know, we signed away our rights to it, and it's a binary. Privacy should be a virtue, right? It's okay for me to know what you had for lunch as long as I pretend like I don't know. We all have to be priests in this case, and we need to guard 
privacy as understand how important it is. And we need to build that into our technology, our hardware, and our cloud services, and perhaps ourselves. The last one, presence and not escapism. There's people working on robots to pick crops because they don't want to deal with the issues of immigration. All right, just let that sink, sink in. We cannot escape humanity through technology without negative consequences, so we should figure out how technology could help us be present with each other and our issues. And last is authenticity over influence. Why does there have to be this view that I can put a fake version of myself out there that talks you into doing something by looking like it's the happiest version of something and I could influence you versus putting authentic selves out there. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much.